and that you took away massive value from, from this event, not just for today, but you know, stuff that's going to help you in the long haul. After this, we'll have some time to hang out, network uh, on the terrace for a cocktail hour. But first and foremost, to end off on a high note, I want to welcome Ezra Firestone from Smart Marketer. Let's go. Just give me the cheese, I'll make the smoke it, yo. It's a make it, please, so don't provoke it, yo. Provoke it, yo. We don't need no speech, so we're not going to cook it, I got some, uh, what is that, is that Sean Paul? All right, I'll take it. Um, how you guys doing? Yeah, cool. I feel confined, um, but that's okay. Uh, you guys look a little bit like, um, anyone here been to Krispy Kreme? Yeah, you, you know, you, you know, you ever see, who's been, raise your hands, been to Krispy Kreme? Okay. You know the donuts, like before they go through that, there's like a glazed waterfall and they come off and they're getting ready to go through it and then afterward they're like glazed over? <laughs> You've had a lot of content, uh, which, is, which is, I would look this way after six hours or seven hours consuming information. And my talk will be a little different. I'm, you know, Maxwell, that's the, that guy. Give it up for Max Finn, ladies and gentlemen. If you do a third of what he just suggested, you will do great. Um, and, you know, he just shared with you a lot of technical and tactical information about how to grow your business. And I want to um, offer you some viewpoints and ideas that will support you in, entre in your journey of entrepreneurship. I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, how does this thing work? There you go. By the way, that's how I feel about being here right now. Come on. If I had even half of that much swag, I would just be, I could just stop being an entrepreneur and I'd just be good. Um, all right. I got a little bit though. Uh, all right. So, so um, one of the things that I think is that in this industry, uh, relationships are really important. And more important than content is who you meet and the connections that you make. I can trace back every leap forward in my business to a relationship made at an event like this. And I want you guys to do me a favor, stand up. And uh, put your hands on your hips like this. And then just rub elbows with that person next to you there. <laughs> All right, you can sit back down. So I, I think that, um, you know, my viewpoint is that where it's at in life is intimacy, connection, relationships with other people. I think that like the only reason that you are trying to make money is so you can have more of that. And if you remember that, you'll do better. Um, the other thing to remember is that, you know, if you made it into this room, you're already in a good spot. You've got a whole day to sit and think about how you can improve your life and generate more wealth. And that's like pretty sweet. So put your hand up like this. All right. Now, everybody. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. Turn it towards you and just pat yourself right on the back there. Uh, all right, we'll stop with all this stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think it really is um, good to remember that, you know, we are in a much better spot than most people. And, uh, and when you remember that, it ends, you end up not only feeling more grateful for where you are, but you end up with more motivation to, to support others. My name is Ezra. Uh, I build brands on the interwebs. Um, I also build teams. I got 103 team members now. And I started out as some guy, just a random dude in a 300 square foot New York City apartment like 13 years ago. And if I can do this stuff, you really can do it. So uh, it's a great time to be getting into this industry, and it's not too late. And if, if I can start with nothing, no money, work in a full-time job, and build up to where I am now, you, this is really possible for you as well. Uh, this is one of my brands. Just one of my brands in the last four and a half years uh, has done close to 70 million. It's a sk skincare brand, and I'll be giving you some examples from that. And all of my companies in the last four and a half years, oh, real quick, this thing's a little funny, huh? Is there a, a place I'm supposed to point this? Uh, if you're closer to the laptop, the better. All right, like that? All right. One of the things I want to show you about, I took a random, uh, this is going to lead into, I'm actually going to give you some things that you should do. I'm also going to attempt to entertain you a little bit. But when, when you take a random sample of that revenue from that store, I want you to notice of, let's say, 47 million, If I back up, all right, then I can't see the screen, but that's okay. Half of it is from first-time visitors, and I don't know how to work this thing very well, apparently. Bear with me. Anybody want to entertain the audience while I figure this out? <laughs> Give me a second. Do you guys have another clicker? Uh, 
that. Oh, here we go. All right, what if I stood... Can you guys still see me if I'm standing here? Is this okay? All right, I'm going to stay here because this seems to work better. So um, half of that revenue is from first-time visitors and half of it is from returning visitors. And this is going to be uh, sort of the basis of the viewpoint that I want to get across to you today. So just remember that and we're going to come back to it. Last four and a half years... Oh, damn. Hold on. You see this? Watch. Bam! Anyone else have flames today? No? So you had flames? I feel like that, should, that is worth a round of applause. Uh, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I just, no. Anyways, yeah. So, you know, I'm making a good amount of money. And um, that's fun. And the reason I show you that is because that's how you show that you know what you're doing in this industry. So when I... Um, you know, I get the opportunity to talk to thousands of entrepreneurs every year, and I, I get a sense of the problems that we as a community face. And the problem that everyone thinks they have is scaling ads profitably. And that is certainly a problem, and guys like Maxwell, you should join his Unicorn Academy, he spends, you know, every week showing you the best ways to do that. So there are solutions to that problem from super high-level experts in the industry who are living and breathing that, that. So if you feel like you have this issue, you don't actually have this issue, and we'll get to that in a minute. The other issues that people in our industry report to me are money and funding. This is generally people who have already made a little bit of cash, and they've got to fund inventory, they've got to fund people, hiring people of their team, they've got to fund things like legal stuff. So this comes when you kind of like hit a million dollars in revenue. Hiring, sourcing, and training. This is a big one, and this is what holds a lot of people back from scale, is doing it all themselves and never learning how to delegate. And we'll touch on that in a minute as well. Diversification, most people and most successful people that you'll run into have one sort of source of their success. It's like Facebook ads. And if Facebook ads goes away, their business is done. Or it's like Amazon. And if Amazon goes away, their business is done. So I'm going to show you how to tackle this as well. Uh, diversification is a real problem. Growth plateaus. People get to a certain point and then they plateau. And that usually stems from... Problem number two, which is they don't know how to get out of their own way and not do everything themselves. And then the last thing, and this is probably the most important, but the one that nobody likes to talk about and uh, nobody wants to, you know, it's a blind spot for most entrepreneurs because we are conditioned to believe that we should be working 14 hours a day, that we should hustle, we should grind, we should be working hard. And we can't see that for the most entrepreneurs, and I can spot it across the room at an event, have a a life work balance problem and they're overwhelmed, they're overstressed, they're working too much, they're not taking care of their bodies, they don't have time for their hobbies, they don't have time for their intimate relationships, they don't have time for their social life and they think that if they just continue to work hard, things will get better, but it actually is, works against you because you can only give from your own surplus and if you deplete yourself to the point of not having any surplus, you burn out, which is the most common reason entrepreneurs fail is burnout. Stress, overwhelm and burnout because they think that they need to work harder. And we'll get to that in a minute as well. So those are the problems that we as a community are facing that thousands of entrepreneurs at every level of the game just getting started, six figures, seven figures, eight figures, report to me, and problems that I have faced myself over the years. So that's sort of the stage to set for kind of like what you might run into on your journey. The question is like, what's the play? And for this little girl, it's to play video games because she's out there doing it. What do you, little boy, what are you playing? Nothing? All right. Well, <laughs> solitaire or something? All right. So the play is brand assets. What you need to be focusing on developing. Hey, how's it going? We met earlier. Um, <laughs> Matt, I appreciate you responding. It was a little bit late, but that's all right. <laughs> so brand assets are what you want to focus on generating. Everyone's so focused on generating customers, but... The better model is to think about your brand in terms of assets. And a brand asset is an email address, like Max was talking about getting for your quiz. A, someone who's watched one of your videos, so they're on a pixeled audience, a Facebook Messenger subscriber, an Instagram follower, a YouTube subscriber, a Facebook fan or like. Those brand assets compound over time to turn into customers. There's a halo effect. It's like you water the garden and you're starting to grow the plant of your business, you're building these brand assets that will flower into customers. And most people quit before that, that, that flower breaks through the soil, but it's right there and they just don't see the results quite yet. 
because they haven't acknowledged that the brand assets that they've developed are valuable. So what you want, and I'm going to show you how to do this, but I want to just, like I've got 45 minutes and I want to communicate something to you that I think will serve you in your entrepreneurial journey, which is what you want is a group of people who are actively engaged with you over time so that when you run a sale or a product launch, they respond to you. And what generates brand assets, what gets a group of people engaged is content. And everyone here in the dropship space might not be thinking about this, but this is, the, this is how you build something that is valuable because I think there's also a misconception that what, what you think you want is cash flow. You think you want a business that makes money so you can draw from it and use that money in your life. But that is actually not the highest level way to look at what you're doing. So I think what we're doing, if you can tell me if you subscribe to this viewpoint as well, but I think the game is resource generation. And I think what we're trying to do is generate as much resource as we can and then use that resource towards causes that we find noble, taking care of our family, taking care of our community, serving the greater world. And cash flow businesses are not the best ways to generate resource. The way that people generate true wealth, if you figure, another tangent is most people are looking three to six months in front of them. They're hungry. They're worried about what's coming down the line. They're worried about paying their bills. They're not looking far enough ahead. And what I'd like you to do is take a look of 10 to 20 years out. Because when I look at my life, I figure I got about 20 years left at this pace. And if I have 20 years left at this pace and I have the goals that I have, which are lofty goals, and I want to take care of a lot of people, I got a lot of people who are counting on me, and I want to generate as much resource as I can, and I look at how wealth is generated, it's not generated from cash flow businesses. It is generated from the sale of assets, asset liquidation, building businesses and then selling them for a multiple of their earnings and then taking that money that you earned from the sale of that asset and deploying it into the market to acquire other assets and operate those and exit those as well. Real wealth comes from asset liquidation. You can acquire assets by buying them. It's what everyone does in the real estate game. Old model is save up money, invest it in real estate, let that asset appreciate, sell it, take that money, play the game bigger. You can do that with business. And if you're going to subscribe to this idea, then what I'm about to share with you becomes all the more important because the way that you run your business is going to dictate the valuation of that business. If we're not just running it for the money we can take out of it, which is a whole other problem we will get to, which is you're so focused on what you can get out of your business, not what you can put into it, which is the right question to ask. We'll get there in a second. If we are going to subscribe to the idea that the game is five to 10 years from now, the game is the future generations. The game is our kids and our kids' kids and our direct community and our family and the world. And how can we generate as much resource as we can in the time that we have? Then the game is how can we have our cash flow business that, yeah, that we're going to create and run so that we can live be as valuable as it possibly can be when we ultimately liquidate it because that is the ultimate hustle. Content. I'll explain why in a minute. Content that you use to engage buyers, subscribers, fans, prospects, so that when you have something to offer them, they know who you are and they like you. We're, I'm gonna tell you, this is an open loop in uh, neuro-linguistic programming. An open loop is when I tell you, I'm gonna tell you about something, and then you are waiting to hear that thing so you're more engaged. So I'm gonna tell you why content is the path towards a more valuable business in a little bit. So that should pique your interest and you let me know how it works, okay? So, zero people were interested in that topic, huh? <laughs> this one guy, got one guy over here. How you doing, man? Doing all right? Cool, man, good. You got great hair, um, really great hair. Uh, it's a, the way these lights, these are pretty intense lights, are shining on that thing is cool. Uh, yeah, man, hey, I'm working on it. Uh, all right, so how do you get that content? I mean, I've been saying this for years. I have been saying this since 2010. And it's truer now than it's ever been. The faceless brands are dying. The purposeless brands are dying. The purposeless brands are only on Amazon. You hear this in terms of your entrepreneurial journey a lot, but not in terms of your brand. The first step is figuring out the why. Why are you in business? What is your mission? What is your story? What is your purpose? What do you have to offer beyond selling a product? If you can figure this out, and I'm gonna give you some ideas, 
you will end up with a more valuable asset. If you're just drop shipping some bullshit that everyone else is drop shipping, some black light flashlight that every other bum has that they got from China that's on Amazon, you do not have something of value. You have a cash flow thing that maybe puts some money in your pocket but is not in the direction of your ultimate goal. If we're taking a longer view, then we understand that it's valuable to spend the time to develop a real brand because it will actually serve us better than drop shipping something. And I'm not anti drop shipping. I mean, I am anti the not knowing where my stuff is made or the labor that made it and whether that labor was treated well. There's some moral and ethical dilemmas that arise that you can handle however you want. But I would urge you to, I started drop shipping before China was an option, American drop shippers back in the day. I would urge you to do whatever you got to do to make money, to cover yourself now. And then whatever profit that you're, you generate, invest into something that could be a valuable asset. And a brand is something that does something beyond, it engages a group of people in something beyond a product for sale. So what is your mission? What is your story? What is your purpose in business? I'll give you some examples. Everlane, these are, I don't think I'm wearing, this is an Everlane shirt. I love Everlane. My favorite new brand, they're a $100 million clothing retailer, direct to consumer online. Their mission was simple. We are going to bring transparency to retail. We think that you're buying a bunch of clothes, you don't know where they're made, how they're made, or what the markup is. We're gonna show you where we make stuff, how we make it, and we're gonna tell you exactly what we pay for it and what we mark it up. We're gonna open up transparency in the retail space. And they're now a $100 million company. On that one mission, their tagline is, um, know your costs, uh, know your factories, always ask why. That tagline explains what they're up to in one sentence. We'll get to that in a second. At Smart Marketer. Smart Marketer is my information blog. It's a side business for me. And it's a, bl a blog where I share what's working for me in my e-commerce businesses. My tagline is, serve the world unselfishly and profit. I think that is a description of what happens. By the way, I think you profit when you are in a role of service and you're doing so for something more than just your own personal gain, although I'm, in, I'm all on board for your own personal gain, I think that's a cool game to play too, but I think if that's the only game you're playing, you're missing out on some of the joys that are available in life and some of the um, gratification that is available in life, which comes when you are in a true role of service. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, hey, here's everything that's working for us. We want you to be able to use it too. Try it out. Let us know how it works. We also have courses for sale. So that's what we're up to at Smart Marketer. And Boom is a pro-age cosmetic line for women over 55. Women are told that their value goes down after 35. Anti-wrinkle, anti-age, dye your hair, tuck it in, tighten it up. All this crazy messaging about how their value is declining. Men, like do with the cool hair, get the opposite conditioning from society. Hey, the more we produce, the more valuable we get. The more money we make, the more valuable we get in the eyes of society. Boom is about offering a viewpoint that life can get better over time and it does not have to get worse. And you don't have to buy into that hustle, the old, you're broken and I can fix you, you stink, buy deodorant trap of how people sell stuff. Um, and I think that you should be able to distill this mission, and we're going to get to why I'm telling you this in a second. This is still kind of like the setting the stage. I think you should be able to distill this mission into one sentence. For Boom, it's, it's about women, it's about beauty, it's about time. That tells you what we're up to. Smart marketer, serve the world unselfishly and profit, it tells you what we're up to. Everlane, know your factories, know your costs, always ask why. You need a tagline. There's a reason why every big brand in the world, Disney, Nike, Capital One, US Postal Service, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Budweiser, Gatorade, L'Oreal, McDonald's, Burger King, they all have a tagline because this works. It allows the community of people who are following you to understand what you are doing in the world and why and why they should engage with your products. And you know who cares about that? The millennial generation, my generation, really cares about how things are made and why they're made. And there's a lot of money to be made in, hear me out on this, manufacturing process transparency. Here is what we made, here is how we made it, and here's why. If you can do that, that what Everlane did, that's what Quip toothbrushes, as you'll get to in a, I'll get to in a second, does. It's a good story, and it works every time. So you need a tagline. Okay. The other thing about having a reason for existing in business beyond, and this is a, a common path is, and I understand this path. I started poor, lights turning off, water going out, uh, mushrooms growing out of my sink, people falling through the floors. I did not have money coming up. So I understand the mindset of being hungry. And I know that when you're hungry, you want to eat and you will play the 
gray area, your moral compass is skewed towards, I will do what I have to do in order to survive, essentially. My family came here as immigrants. I, I get the game, right? But something tends to happen, which is once you are taken care of, the next thing that you want to do, most people want to do, is take care of the folks around them. And then the next thing that, that you want to do is take care of any other folks that you can take care of. It turns out that the most satisfying thing you can do is be in the role of service. It's really fun. And so if you have a reason to be in business or a reason for your brand or what you're up to that is greater than just yourself and your own um, desires and goals, your brand will have a better shot and it will be more valuable as we'll get to in a second. So let's talk about how you do this. I think it's important and I think a lot of people, especially in the stages of just getting into the game, miss this. And it's worth taking the time to figure this out before you get started. So the methodology that I would like you to use, and it is quite simple and it's easy, but it is nuanced and there's a lot there. There's a lot of there there, as some people say. I call it the engage and filter method. And Maxwell does this in his unicorn academy business. I do this in my smart marketer business, but people who sell physical product, I do this in my boom business. This is my whole shtick in business. This is all I do, by the way. This is responsible for hundreds of millions in sales, billions if you count all of my students who are using this. It's very simple. People in the physical product space haven't quite got this yet. It's called the engage and filter method. The idea is you have groups of people, people who bought from you in the past, people who are subscribed to you, and people who don't know about you yet. And you put content in front of them, video content, article content, audio content, short form video, long form video, content in front of them. The people who consume that content, you then filter out and you sell them stuff, either on your own website or on Amazon. You engage them first and then you offer them something for sale. The idea here is that what a business does is communicate with a group of people. And if you can understand this, you'll be very successful in business and you'll never be out of a job if you, wanna, if you don't want the pressure of being an entrepreneur. Which, by the way, for those of you who are just getting into this, I would like to warn you ahead of time that it's pretty intense. Because another thing that happens with entrepreneurs is, is as their businesses get bigger, the intensity and the pressure grows. You're the bottom line for paying everyone's salary. You're the bottom line for keeping the thing afloat. You're the bottom line for making sure the, the bills are paid. Like the intensity gets more and more and more intense as the thing gets bigger. Biggie said it, more money, more problems. It's true, it really is. There's, there is that side of it that like shit gets more intense as it gets bigger. Anyways, what a business does is communicate with a group of people who are sharing a collective experience. Women over 50 who are experiencing the aging process and having everyone tell them that that's wrong. Online business owners who sell physical products who want to do that better. People who run Facebook ads who aren't having the results they want to get. Men who are 25 to 45 who live in, uh, on the west side of America who have beards and want to care for those beards. Dudes who buy ripped jeans, whatever. Group of people who are sharing a collective experience. And your job as a brand is to engage that group of people around that experience, offer value to them through content by touching on the topics and conversations and problems they are having, and then offer them solutions to those problems. The way that we do this is we put out content that's related to the experiences that our community is having. Menopause, which is a hormonal shift that women after 45 go through. Men actually go through a similar hormonal shift, but it doesn't get the same press that uh, menopause gets because menopause comes with side effects like hot flashes and things like that. Hair graying, skin wrinkling, under eye bags, a lot of things come up. These are experiences that this group of people is having that we can talk about. Um, you know, your, your cost per click going up, your store not converting, your not being able to get your product. There's experiences, this is the smart marketer group now. We create content that is related to this experience that touches on these experiences, that offers value in the direction of them, and we put it out in front of them on Facebook. These are some boom ones, videos, articles. This is some smart marketer ones, videos, articles, images. And then the people who consume it, we go to Facebook and we say, hey, we want to create an audience. This is going to circle back to that repeat business thing in a second. We want to create an audience of people who are engaged with our videos, who've watched 50% or more of them. We should choose our videos. And then we run ads to them to buy our stuff. We only try to sell to the people who bought stuff or who consumed our content. Now, 
Guys like Max will teach you front-end sales funnels to get new customers in the door. And I am not saying do this at the exclusion of that. But what I'm saying is that in today's market, the game is not get a customer. The game is get a repeat customer. Because with how expensive traffic is, you're probably going to be about break-even for most people. Some people can do profitable customer acquisition, but most people are going to be break-even on their customer acquisition. I actually use this on the front end of my business as well. This is my business model for getting new customers as well. But if you just took this idea, you used Max's strategies to set up sales funnels on Facebook and go out and buy new customers for your dropship store, and then you use this strategy to re-engage them with content and then cross-sell them and upsell them additional items, your business is now worth three times what it was when you were just getting new customers in the door without half. You saw half of my revenue was coming from repeat business, right? When you sell a business, some factors go into the valuation of that business. So let's say your business makes, for argument's sake, a million dollars a year. And let's say the profit on that is, is 10%. You make a hunt after you pay for ad cost and cost of inventory and cost of paying your team and insurance and all the stuff that goes into running a business. You got a hundred grand left in it. That business is worth between one and 10 times that profit. It's worth one time that profit if it's a dropship business that has no repeat business and only has one source of traffic. It's worth two, three, four, five, six times that profit if things like you have you know, 40 or 50 percent of your revenue is coming from repeat business. If maybe you have additional sources of visibility that aren't just Facebook. So these factors, this one in particular, having an engaged community and a whole lot of brand assets, email addresses, Facebook Messenger subscribers, Facebook followers, Instagram followers, YouTube subscribers, repeat business, those brand assets affect the valuation. And the game is the valuation. The game is not the cash flow you take out of the business. You'll understand this in a couple of years, and you'll probably understand it now, but as your business grows, you'll understand it more. So you engage people, and then you filter them out. When we are running, just a quick aside here, by the way, how's this going for you? Good? Yeah? Happy? Enjoying this? All right, cool. Um, let's give it up for Anthony Mastaloni, ladies and gentlemen. How, how do you say your last name? Mastalone? Tony Mastalone. It's a good, it's a good one. Hey, Tony. Where's my, where's Josh? Is Josh in the room? Can you say it? Do it in the, do it in your Italian voice. Hey, how you doing over there? Hey, Tony Mastalone. This guy's always doing the, uh, you know, Italian voice. Um, all right. Well, why don't we get back to business? Uh, so when we go out to get new customers, we use video ads for the most part. We also use image ads and GIF ads and stuff like that, but videos are probably 75% of what we run. And right now, so this is once you're filtering people out and trying to sell them stuff, or maybe you're using a front-end sales funnel that is not related to the engage and filter method. It's just to trying to get new customers for you. Right now, this video formula is our best formula. I just wanted to quickly show it because I've spent about $4 million on this formula this year. It's called Love Demo Love, so, or the testimonial sandwich. So we open with... A face-to-camera customer testimonial. Someone, we usually do like four or five women, five seconds each, showing our product, talking about the ownership benefit of the product, why they like it, what it's done for them. Quick, cycling through, 20 seconds, four women, 20 seconds, five women, sometimes 10 seconds a woman for 40 seconds, but quick, fast testimonials from people. It could be your cousin who actually tried your product and liked it. And then you demonstrate the product. You go into a demo of the product in use, and then you end with social proof. This is our best formula right now for front-end uh, advertising videos. Love about the product, product demonstration, love about the product. Um, and if you go to Boom by Cindy Joseph Facebook page and you click on ads, you will see dozens of examples of this running active. You can see all my ads running. And one of the other things that we kind of found, if you were selling to baby boomers, this is kind of a quick aside, there's like a reverse ageism thing happening where women who are 65 don't want to hear women who are 45 telling them about aging. So what we had to do was have videos of my business. I am not just like some young guy who thinks I know about what it's like to be an older woman. By the way, my business partner is in that age demo, so she knows what's up. So I have some idea of it because I was raised by a bunch of women and they tell me about their experience, but 
just for those of you who might be wondering that. So anyways, um, we have, you know, we're segmenting it by age range. 45 to 50, we have women who are 45 to 50. 50 to 60, we have women who are 40, 50 to 60. So we have different people to represent the different uh, ages. And you might have different people to represent the different types of people that you sell to. It's always better to have a more diverse uh, group of people representing your product because that way you can talk to everyone who might be interested in it. Here's some examples of that. You can see we've got, you know, 45, 55, 60, 70, the whole range. Uh, and just to show you real quick, um, in addition to the video, we open up with social proof. So we use a customer testimonial as the opening for our ad copy. And then we go into our own description of the benefit of owning the product. But only after we've let one of our customers speak on our behalf. Because you clearly think you're cool. But do other people think you're cool? That's what you have to have come across in order to be believable. Um, we edit our videos into a square and we put an additional headline in them and we also edit in our own caption. So we have a square canvas for the video. So, so where it says makeup in minutes and those captions, that's actually all the video file. And the rectangle video plays in the middle, but it turns into a square because we've in the video file edited in a, a top line that is a headline and edited in our own big captions. We've modified the video so that it's a square so that it takes up more real estate on mobile phones where most traffic is coming from. Um, you guys take a picture. I'm going to give you a link to download my slides at the end of this. I wonder if I'm running. How am I doing on time? Anyone know what time it is? 47. Okay, I got a little bit of time. Cool. So that's the 30,000 foot view. There is more nuance here, but what I'm trying to communicate to you is that we are in the attention business. We need to engage audiences and then filter out the people who are engaged and offer them products and services. Facebook's in the attention business. They need to keep you glued to your Instagram app. The more of your attention they have, the more advertising they can sell to people who are trying to advertise to you. You are in the same business. You need to aggregate attention. And the best way to do that is to figure out what group of people are you talking to, what conversations are they having, and create content to put in front of them. This is the... Everyone has this opportunity today. We are in the influencer culture. Anyone can create content about any little niche thing. I know a guy who's a pe fence painter, makes content about painting fences. There's a whole bunch of ways to do it, it turns out, and then sells paint and stuff. Like, it doesn't have to be big, but this is the game, is group of people sharing collective experience who you can add value to through documenting what you know about and what you can offer to that experience and then having products for sale that are related to that. That's the business opportunity of today. Regardless of if you sell information or physical products. Max and I have similar businesses, information and physical products and software. It doesn't really matter what you're selling if you understand that this is the game that we're playing. And this is how you fortify yourself from channels. This is how you don't have to be worried if Facebook shuts you down. I got a million email addresses. I got ads on Google. I've got phone numbers. I got Facebook Messenger subscribers. I have more than just my advertising. I have brand assets that I can monetize. Nearly half of our revenue comes from returning visitors. Content is how we get them to come back to our store. We send emails about our content. They go to our blog. Note that we're using Facebook's hosted video on our blog so that even if we emailed them and they watched it on our blog, we can still retarget them on Facebook. We can see what they watched and then follow up with them even if they weren't watching it on Facebook. But ultimately, they end up back at our store. These are all content emails. But every one of them makes money because people remember who we are and then they come back to our store. The thing about a content business is that consistency is key. Tone, cadence, voice, relationship is built. The people who you like are the people who you, sell, you spend the most time with. It's why there's this, in the uh, marriage world, I'm married, people who go and work nine to five jobs, they're gone all day. They're in their office, in their cubicle, or wherever they are with the people that they are working with. They come home, they're tired, they got to take care of the kids, and they only see their partner for an hour or two at night. They end up falling in love with and having affairs with people in their workplace because they are seeing those people all the time. The people who you grow intimacy with are the ones who you're around. If you just put out a piece of content once every six weeks or whatever, you're never going to be, you're not going to have enough to build a relationship. So I would suggest that you aim for one video or article per week, if possible. And I think video is by far the best because um, consumption tracking, you can track who consumes it and follow up with them. You can build a relationship with consistent uh, audio. And it doesn't have to be you. It can be someone else. It can be multiple people. I don't use myself in Boom. I use myself for Smart Marketer. And I do think that 
There's no reason not to build an audience around your own persona if you have that desire because it's available for all of us today and it offers a lot of benefits if you want to be an influencer in a given marketplace, but you don't have to be. I mean, look at Boom. Look at Zip. Uh, well, Zipify is kind of around me too, but Be Friendly is not. So I think that it's a good thing to do, but it's not necessary. Um, and it easily transforms into other mediums. You can transcribe it and turn it into an article and amplify that. Types of content that you can create that will be helpful in any market. Your opinion or your company's opinion on anything is the best kind of content. What you think, that's what people want to know. What do you think about X? Educational videos that educate people. I got, I got a guy who sells knives. He doesn't even create his own videos. He just finds videos on YouTube of knife skills. And he's like, hey, check out Emerald Lagasse. Bam, banging out onions with his knife. By the way, you could do the same thing with our knife. So he doesn't even create his own stuff. He just shares YouTube videos. Um, behind the scenes, which is more into that like manufacturing process transparency. Anything that is, hey, take a look at what we're doing. That works. Industry-specific content, timely and relevant to current events. This is what Max is doing in the uh, political space. Whatever's happening right then, he's talking about, I'm sure. Yeah. And that's working. I didn't actually know that. I was just hoping that was the case, but it turned out it was. Um, tips lists. I really like this. Five makeup tips for women over 50. Uh, eight skincare tips for aging skin. Um, six tips to have your landing page convert better. I do these a lot. Community feedback, listening to what your community is saying and commenting on that. Interviews, I do interviews with Max. He does, he's booked me for an interview on his blog in a week or two. Interviews with other brands in your community is a really good thing to do. Curated content, that's the guy using the YouTube videos, curating other people's content. And then anything that's related to the problems and conversations that your community is already having. So those are some ideas. The key to remember is that if you are commenting on a shared experience that a group of people is having, then you're going to do well. We had this, um, we sent an email to our email list with the subject line, after a three-year bout with anorexia, this happened, dot, dot, dot. We had a four, this is the highest open rate I've ever had an email in my entire life, to an email list of hundreds of thousands of people. I had a 46% open rate. And what I realized was I had underestimated. I, so once I saw that, I was like, whoa. Because one of the women, we interview women. One of, the, one of our things. I have a whole course, by the way, on my blog, smartmarketer.com forward slash courses. It's called Smart Social. You can scroll down to it. And it talks about, it goes really deep on how to create content that's geared around shared experiences. And there's a free training. You don't have to buy the course. Although you should buy the course, but you don't have to. That talks about this. But um, one of the ways that we do that is we interview women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s about what it's like. What does beauty mean to them now versus what it meant in their 20s? What does sexy mean to them now versus what it meant in their 20s? How do they feel about menopause? How do they feel about gray hair? Things like that. Silver hair. Well, after seeing this open rate, I started looking into this a little bit. And I was, um, I, I had taken, I, I was not aware, being a guy who is not uh, conditioned in the same way that women are, that my appearance is what brings me value in the world, how many women struggle with eating disorders? It, is, it will blow your mind how prevalent it is. So once I saw that open, I was like, wow, okay, this is an experience that my community is having that we were not talking about, that once we started talking about, boom, it hit. So you can also follow those threads. Anyways, it's about the shared experience. That's an example of us finding a new shared experience, which, you know, we missed. If you can be funny, that's really, really good. People make it on being funny. So if you have that together, that's, that's helpful. Listicles work super well. These are all listicles, right? Uh, tips on overcoming perfectionism. Tips for under eye circles. Skincare tips for women over 40. Tips work. Okay. So, I'm almost to like the end of my shtick here. But first and foremost, I wanted to communicate to you that the game is asset liquidation and resource generation. And if you're going to subscribe to the idea that what you're trying to do is generate as much resource as you can in the time that you have allotted to you, then what you need to be generating are brand assets, not just revenue coming in the door, but assets that a brand that has an identity owns that you could then sell one day. However you do that, you just have to understand that that's the game that you're playing or you're going to miss the whole point of this business thing. So my businesses since 2015 have been doing over 10 million a year. And I started in 2005, so it took me a decade to get there. Um, and so I wanna 
for those of you that are interested in the journey of wealth creation, which is a super fun game to play, um, I want to tell you about what I see that brands that are getting over 10 million uh, have slash do. So number one, they have a truly great product. Quip toothbrushes. The product has to be so good that when someone uses it, they go, man, I really like this thing. This is awesome. Like, if you are selling a shitty product, what are you doing? What was the point of all the work you did to sell someone something if you're going to send them something that sucks? Every one of these products existed. Quip toothbrushes. Uh, actually, wool, wool shoes were kind of new. Tushy, that's a bidet. That's a plastic bidet that goes on your toilet and sprays your butt. M. Jemmy, uh, fancy Italian shoes. Purple mattress, pillows. Every one of these products in these categories existed. Uh, these are M. Jemmy shoes, by the way. I really like them. Uh, if you're interested in being fashionable and shit, M. Jemmy. Uh, but even though you don't need a unique product, it can be a me too. How many electric toothbrushes exist in the market? They just went and made a really good one. So if you can get something that is really good, and you can go to a farmer's market and find someone who's making custom soaps and say, hey, can I buy your soaps at wholesale and I'm going to sell them on the internet and put my own label on them. That works as long as the soap is good. That's called private labeling. Great business model. Highly recommend. Step one, move from drop shipping to private labeling. Step two, move from private labeling to manufacturing your own products. It's a good path to travel. It's the path I travel. So you need a really good product. And it, it is worth taking a year to develop a good product because that good product, see, if you're going to build a skyscraper, you got to go down two stories first. If you don't go down two stories and it starts to grow, it's going to fall over, right? So I'm working on a new cosmetic line for women 25 to 45. I'm a year into this. Turns out with cosmetics, the pigmenting is the issue. Bright reds, bright purples. The way that cosmetics are pigmented are with heavy metals. Heavy metals are not good to absorb into your skin. So we're working on a new way to pigment cosmetics. But I'm a year in, and I now have a product. It has taken me a year and about 10 grand of research and development and time and energy and someone on my team going to trade shows. But I now have something that is potentially the foundation for a seven or eight figure brand. It's worth it to make a good product. You need to go all in on expansion. Take a look at this. These two products are the only things I sell to new customers. Two things are what I sell to new people who come in the door, who find me. They buy my cosmetics. All the rest of my products are skincare. Every person in the world has an organic skincare line. They buy skincare from me because they know, like, and trust me. They come to me for the cosmetics. That's an easier thing to sell. It's more fun. It's more exciting. And then, once they're my customers, I've got a whole bunch of other stuff to sell them. So once you have a way to generate customers, you need additional offers. I learned this from guys like Dr. Axe. Product launches work super well. So when, you're, when you have a, a group of brand assets, you can launch products to them. The other thing they do is they go all in on email. You can see here from uh, July to July of last year, we did 18 million and 34% of that revenue came from email. Email is still the most effective communication medium between brands and subscribers, which is why Max's strategy of using a quiz to generate email leads is a good one. Because then everyone's on your email list and over time you can send them content and offers. You need to send a lot more emails than you're sending. Content emails, sales emails. We run a sale every six weeks. I think you should too, no matter how big your email address is, email list is. So send more emails. Millennial brands understand this next one, which is user-generated content. This can be your only content strategy. Everybody who buys from you, send them an email two weeks after they buy and say, hey, listen, I'll give you $15, $20 in store credit to my store, or $10. If you send me a video, holding it up on your iPhone, holding my product, talking about why you love us, what our product did for you, what your life was like before you bought our product, and what it's like after, and why you'd recommend someone else buy from us. And then you take those quotes, and you put them next, you take the reviews you get from your testimonials, put them next to your product image, you amplify that. You use them as your videos, as your ads on your sales pages, in your emails. You ever seen anyone happier than that woman? You have never seen anyone in your life happier than that lady was about her all-in-one moisturizer. Homegirl was stoked. And you know what? That cost me $10 in store credit, and that might be one of the best ads I've ever had. Because the sheer enthusiasm that she brought to the table in that video is one of the greatest things that ever happened. So, so you want to be doing that. 
Um, let's see. Ah, they also understand product and story. You guys are all focused on product. What is it? What are the benefits of it? How do I sell it? The story is the who and the why. Who are they? Why are they buying this in the first place? If you can get that together, yeah, of course you need the what and the benefits. What is the thing? What are the benefits of it? But everyone has that. You got to get the story down. And that is what everybody seems to be missing. And it's one of the reasons why I can show up. I happen to be a good software developer, but I wasn't until I just started trying it. And after several years of failing and doing stuff poorly, I got pretty good at it. But I can show up in the Shopify ecosystem and create an offer that exists in the marketplace already. Now, granted, I believe I have done it better and added to it in ways that nobody else has, but I can build a multi seven figure business that's probably valued around 15 million right now because I understand who my people are and why they would want this thing and I can tell a better story than my competition. You see, the promise sells the product. The product just has to deliver on the promise. What you gotta get good at is making good promises. Who, she who makes the best promise sells the most. And then your product delivers on that promise. Just has to be good enough. Doesn't even have to be the best product in the market. The best product in the market loses all the time to the best promise in the market. Just has to be good. You get out of your business what you put into it. You guys are all so focused on you. I mean the royal you of our community. Focus on what can they get out? How can they ball out on Instagram and rent Lambos and wear gold chains and fedoras and be on Mallorca on the beach and show off to their friends and shit? The, the question is not what you can take out. The better question is what more can you put in? Who can you get to help you? Who can you get to invest? What can you, how can you make it better for your team? How can you make this thing better? If that is the question you're asking, the snowball will have time to get big. And by the time you take money out of it, it will be really big. A lot of times what happens with growth plateaus is the energy invested, including the money that the business makes, that's energy invested, is what fuels the business forward. People start to make a little bit of money and they start putting it in their pocket and they start going to fancy restaurants and they start going to Vegas and they start doing all kinds of shit with their money that they shouldn't be doing. Not paying their taxes is another huge issue. Instead of letting, all, instead of living, cool, it, you know, living well but below their means, being cool, and investing 100% of it back in. If you give the snowball time to build, then it gets bigger. And a real big problem is as soon as it starts to work, you drain it of its lifeblood. So you got to figure out what more can you invest. That's the question to ask yourself every day. Can I do a better sales funnel? Is there someone who I can learn from who can help me? Is there someone who will invest in this? How can I get my ads to do better? How can I make better products? What more can I invest in this is your question. Not what can I get out of this thing. And another one is like, and this one is so prevalent, you guys. It is not about how much you work. It is about what you produce. And you can produce really amazing things, and in fact, you will produce better things working less. You're, you know, there's a law that says, a law of physics or something, that work will fill the time that you give it. And it's tempting to let work just be the backdrop of your entire life, because you work from your computer and you can work anywhere and it's always available to you. If you do not have the eternal vigilance to set boundaries around your work life, wake up, move your body, drink some water, eat a good breakfast, have some fun with your family, and then start working. And then stop. Start at maybe 9 or 10, stop at 5 or 6, and do things like hobbies, and having fun, and spending time with your partner, or trying to get a partner, or whatever. You'll burn out, and you will not make it. I've seen so many people treat this like a sprint, and just, I've been in this industry now, I'm pretty young, but I've been in this industry for between 13 and 15 years. I can't do the math in my head, but the point is, I've seen a lot of people on a real good path who end up burnt out. And I'm still here because, not because I'm anything special, just because I am clear about what I can actually do and I don't drain myself. I show up every day with a positive attitude and I take the next step in the direction of growing my business because the big secret to success is consistency. Repetition is what creates mastery. You Having the willingness to show up and put your attention in one area consistently over time. Pick up the instrument, 30 minutes a day, you get better at it. Focus on your business, even for an hour a day, it will do well. And you're judging your, 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 your operations too soon. It takes you a year to figure out what the thing is. 
six months to build the technology stack, six months to market it, you're 24 months in, now you can begin to judge it. And even then, you've only been marketing it for six months. You gotta give yourself more time and you gotta be consistent. It's like a diet or a workout program. It doesn't work if you just do it here and then stop. Do it. it has to be every day or every other day, a certain amount of time, showing up to it, looking for how you can do a better job. Um, you can get my slides at smartmarketer.com forward slash DGS. You can follow me on Instagram at Ezra Firestone. Um, that's what I got. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ezra. The man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take a quick picture right here. Oh. If I can't dwell, it can't be done. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Or not. Uh, yeah, if you want to do some questions, guys, if you have any questions for Ezra, feel free to line up real quick. Uh, we got a few minutes until, well, pretty much whenever Ezra's ready to I got go. like five minutes. All right, he's got five minutes. Go ahead. How far is that car, Josh? Yeah. All right. How's it going, Ezra? Uh, I know that you harp really hard on creating content um, that really connects with the people that you're advertising to. A big problem that I always run into when I'm creating content is I always feel like what I'm creating might not be good enough. Um, it's maybe like a little bit more personal than what I would like it to be. So how do you overcome these sort of like mental barriers when it comes to creating content? So I, th I think I understand what you're asking and I'm going to try to answer it. So I think that in general people's biggest problems is their own viewpoints about themselves. People think they are the wrong shape, the wrong size, they don't smell good, they're not cool enough, they don't have the right body, they're not chiseled enough, they're too chiseled, they're not skinny enough, they're too, whatever. And it's for your customers and whoever is looking at the content to decide whether or not it's good. Your job is to put something out and see how it does and then put something else out and see how it does and then put something else out and see how it does. Your job is to just consistently make stuff and eventually something's gonna work. And if you're showing up to that, having a good time, not worrying about how you're being perceived or how you're coming across or whether or not your hair looks good, but just actually having a good time. See, what, what is attractive is fun. People do the Zoolander look in their pictures, you know what I mean? I don't even know how to do it. But that shit doesn't look good, man. What looks good is someone who's having fun, who's lit up, who's enjoying themselves. So if you are, are you the one on camera? Uh, no, sometimes. It depends okay. who I'm working with. So then maybe I'm going in the wrong thread here. What's the question? Uh, even for example, uh, I did a, 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 I had a jewelry brand at one point. Um, I was creating, for example, say like slideshow videos of uh, like jewelry, for example. Okay. I would look at it and I would like constantly critique it to the point where I, yeah. would, I wouldn't even put it out. You know what I mean? Sure. Well, that's analysis paralysis, man. Mm -hmm. You're analyzing your stuff and you're paralyzed in that spot. And that's another trap people get caught in. Perfectionism is a good, good um, trait, but ultimately you got to just do stuff. You got to prolificity beats. Perfectionism every time. Tupac, Jimi Hendrix, Johann Sebastian Bach, all of these people put out so much stuff and then one or two or three or four or five and in Tupac's case and in Bach's case, a lot of stuff, but like prolific is the, get, is the goal. Mm. And then some of it's going to be good and some of it's not. Okay. But you got to get comfortable in that flow of creating. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think you're doing good, man. Thank you so much. Cool shirt. I appreciate, appreciate yeah, right on. Hey, dude, hair guy. What's up, man? Oh, man. Are those, you got the dyed, dude. You know what was in when I was in high school? Bleached tips, and you brought it back. Hey, there you go. <laughs> I wrote a couple questions down for you. Um, on the um, video ads, how many views do you think I should get before running a 50% uh, video view content? Um, you know, 1,000. 1,000? Yeah, uh, 500. I mean, you can start running those ads immediately and just put the budgets really, really low. Okay, okay. And another thing for you. Um, you said how it's so important to build your brand and how to really engage with your audience and get that following. Would you recommend focusing on one brand at a time? Yes. I definitely would recommend focusing on one thing at a time because there's like what they call the shiny object syndrome, which is you're trying to do a whole bunch of things and you end up going really wide but never going deep. It's much better to go really deep on one thing and build that out and focus on it and give it the energy it needs to grow than try to do a whole bunch of things concurrently because you think they're all good opportunities. Good opportunities keep coming. When I got into the game, AdWords and SEO were a good opportunity and then it was Facebook ads and then it was Amazon and then it was Pinterest and now it's Instagram and then it's Snapchat. Opportunities are a dime a dozen. The question is, do you have the ability to show up every day and keep digging even when it's hard, even when things don't work, even when it fails, even when you're struggling or you're not feeling well? 
If you just go deep, it will serve you. And this is the problem that a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck in is they're like, I have a friend who was working at one of the biggest companies in our industry, and he always had like, oh, I'm doing this thing and this thing, and I'm partnering with these people. And I was, every time I would see him at an event, every three or four months, I'd say, hey, man, pick one thing and just do that. Drop everything else. He's like, this is such a good opportunity and these people. And he just, for years, has been caught in this trying to do too much shit. And it's like once something is going and active and working, okay, great. You can move on to something else. But until you have one thing that's a million dollars a year or more, don't do anything else. Thank you. Right on. Hey, Ezra. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion, sort of the state of the union on... Pinterest right now. State of the Union. Uh, Pinterest is both a comparison shopping engine and a query-based traffic tool. So people type in queries, uh, and it is where mostly women between the ages of 25 and 45 go to plan uh, purchase decisions. Sure. It's great for that market. Um, they just rolled out age segmentation. It's a really wonderful traffic source. I'd recommend if your market is 25 to 45-year-old women, some men are on there too, but it's yeah. mostly a female platform then you start with retargeting because they can now give you a pixel that you can put on your website. Oh, sure. you can, I'm doing five, uh, six yeah. figures okay. on, on Pinterest. On Pinterest? I know you used to, you used to teach it well, so, a marketer. Yeah, and so what happened was they, boom, right? it was great when, right. it, when, it, when it first came out yeah. and nobody was using it. I could buy basically all the traffic on their platform I could get for really, really cheap because nobody. I was the only person running ads, basically. Could, and You could bid less than 10 cents? I, could, I was getting... They won't, they won't crazy like, amounts yeah. of traffic back in early 2015 right. or maybe late 2014 and doing really well. Spending like a thousand bucks to make 50 grand. Right. It was the best traffic source I'd ever had. And then people started adopting it and traffic got more expensive and more people were on there and it stopped converting for me because my, my offers will only convert to women over 55, the offers that I would run on Pinterest. I wouldn't run a business to business or you know, uh, information publishing offer on Pinterest. There's not enough of these folks on there. Yep. So now that they have age segmentation, which they just rolled out again, it's on our list to go back and test it, but we've been off since maybe end of last year. Okay. Do you guys plan on putting out another course anytime? If it works for us. If it works. Yeah. I mean, we probably should, right? We've got a lot of stuff we've got to do, man. I'm, I'm behind on the whole course creation. I've been hiring people to create courses for my brand, like Molly Pittman. Do you know her? She's doing all my traffic training now because, like, I, as my role of CEO of Zipify Boom and Smart Marketer has become more intensive. I've had less time for education. So most of my education happens like the in-depth stuff in my Blue Ribbon Mastermind right. for my e-commerce folks. And then I do like front-end stuff. I speak at events and I do blog posts. And I, I'm the guy who's out there. What I can do that nobody else can do is go out and get aggregate attention. I can do that really well. But Molly can teach a course as good as anyone in the world. So I've been kind of taking that model with Smart Marketer a little bit more where I'm no longer the lead educator. I still do some teaching, and I still will, but that's kind of why. Okay, thanks for your time. Thanks, man. Yeah, and I'd love to, hey, man, if you got Pinterest stuff and you want to share it on Smart Marketer, send me an email. Okay. Ezra at smartmarketer.com. No pressure, man. No, no, I mean, I'm You want to teach a Pinterest course? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah with, with your help. Sure. All right, let's talk. Make it profit on it. Right. I want to be better. Than yeah, let's talk, man. I love Pinterest. It was a great platform. It just, you know, stopped working for us. Um, I'll take this question, but then I got to go. It's not really ecom related, but I heard you talking about that you're producing color pigments like uh, heavy metal free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you be selling those as well, or is it? Will you I will be sell uh, selling the. I don't uh, selling it to people who can then sell it. Yes. So wholesaling it. Yes. Probably not, because you know, for me, I feel that the money is in the brand, and the amount of research and develop. See, the um, the sustainability movement is very big right now. The environment, the uh, global warming, just like sustainability in general is a big movement. And so intellectual property in that space is valuable. And I have spent uh, over a year now developing some intellectual property in that space that I intend to build a brand around. So it probably doesn't make sense to sell that to other business owners. It probably makes sense to leverage that to build a brand, which I think I'll do. Maybe at some point. But wholesaling has always been a tough model because um, your buyers are constantly drilling you for your margins. Like the e-commerce merchants who are selling it direct to the consumer want better and better margins. So as they order more, they gouge you. It's a whole thing. I don't think I'll do it. But if you're interested, you can email my team and maybe we can point you in the direction of a sustainability trade show. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Clap it up for Ezra. Wow. Talk about a closeout to the event. That was unbelievable. Thank you so much, Ezra. Another round of applause. Come on.
So for Digital Growth Summit 2019, by a show of hands, who learned something new or had a breakthrough moment today? That is exactly what I love to see and hear. And it's an absolute blessing that all of you guys were here. Thank you guys so much for attending. Thank you to our speakers. A round of applause to every single one of our speakers. And also to yourselves, because it shows a serious sign of interest, not just interest, but beyond that, commitment to change your current situation or take things to the next level. So more so than anything else, I'd love to hear your feedback over the stuff that you've learned today over the long haul, how it goes by implementing into your business, and more so than anything else, thank you all so much for attending. Now we're going to cocktail hour right outside on the terrace until 8 o'clock. Thank you guys so much.